sit. Whenever I have Weaver go through the front door or any major boundary, I always do the same thing, the same exercise. He sits, I step in first, he stays in the sit stay, he calmly waits for me to come back and to walk through with me calmly without pulling. Okay. And sometimes you have to like almost stop at the threshold because of course most dogs are used to pulling their owners through and rushing through doorways so it's a great place to practice having him be calm and respectful of what you want him to do which is to not go through that doorway without you not pull you through and it's a great exercise it keeps him calm in other areas as well so right here so we just came in and, and I'm just kind of uh, putting him where he need, he's straight in front of the mat because <clears throat> I'm going to send him to the mat. So he's on your left, of course, with your right hand, you pat his chest and say, go to your mat, then say down. And notice how when I sent him over, I walked over with him so I could say down right there. And then you start this exercise where um, he's just in, a, he's practicing a downstay only, he's practicing it on the mat, of course. And you just do a basic downstay where you walk around both ways. That's just the basic, of course, downstay where the dog stays down, no matter where you go, all the way around from both sides with him. And then you reward him, and I'm going to just put this good on the mat. See how I waited respectfully until I left it there. I withdrew and he took it off the mat. He's not grabbing it out of my hands. He's not, uh, you know, being disrespectful. He's really waiting until I reward him. I'll do it again. Good. And I've got this, there's one little dog here that's really noisy that I brought out here on purpose to show you also how Weaver could handle uh, different levels of stress. And um, I'm gonna unveil this little dog in a moment after I show you a couple other things and just to show you all the different, this is just an example of some of the stressful things that now that he knows how to do these commands, we start putting, um, real life stressful situations uh, in front of him so that see what he can handle. So we're building him up for when he eventually comes home to you so he can handle uh, stresses there. And of course they're not gonna be the same stresses. We couldn't possibly recreate your household exactly, but all the stuff like the things you're gonna see in public and all the things I'm doing in my household definitely will help him be different once he comes back home. And you'll have a record on video of course of good how to handle those stresses at home too because you'll be doing this this uh, mat exercise with him at home so you just continue this in the in the presence of whatever stresses you have there that you want to work on so once you do just basic stuff walking around walking back and forth making sure he's calm and he's he's accepting the reward taking it off the mat not touching your hand not grabbing trying to grab the food then you can start doing things that are more difficult for him to handle for example I'm gonna walk way into the back of the house, way far away from him, disappear. And see this, see how he turned his body a little bit too much? So if this happens, you have a choice of just taking some, some of the treat. This is the natural balance sausage we're using. Taking some of that and just luring him to be straight. If you draw, draw him back that way and then draw him forward like this, and I never touched him, right? I just lured him, and then once he's where you want him to be, good. You can do it that way, or I could have stood next to him. I could have, no. So let's pretend that I said okay, because he got up anyway, and reset him like this. And I'm gonna say down this time. So if he's all crooked and you can't get him to move, then you just say okay, you do a circle, you put him back, no. And then you say down and reset him so that he's straight on the mat. So now we'll just continue our little exercise. So I'm gonna go back there again and this time he's not allowed to turn around like that. Out of his sight. He can look but as, as long as his body doesn't turn to the side like he did before. And then you always come back and you always reward from exactly the same place, right? In the middle. Good. If he's over here or over there, don't adjust where you give him the treat to where he is. You put it right there. The only reason that I've done, gone to the side either time is because I want you to see how he's accepting the reward. But in general, you want to put it right there. 
Good. See how I put his foot on the other side of my hand? I'm rewarding right in the center of the mat on, on the end of the mat. That's generally the way you want to do it. You want him to adjust his body to what you're doing. Don't adjust everything according to what he does. You need to stay in control and have him follow the rules. Down on the mat, right in the middle, more, more or less. Rewarding right there in the middle. Good. He waits until you withdraw and then he takes it off the mat. So now let's do some things that are harder for him to handle. Very often when you sit down on a piece of furniture, it's an invitation for the dog to get up and come over to you. So of course we worked on that. We kind of do things that might trigger him more, which he knows that he doesn't get up until he's released. Good, you always come back no matter what you do, where you go, reward from the same place. Now I'm gonna go back in the hallway, close the door behind me, make some noise and come out. If you're ever gonna do something that you think is difficult for him to handle, it's okay to remind him down before you do that difficult distraction. I'm gonna go back here, close the door, knock on the door pretty vigorously, come back. You stayed there, come back in front as always. Good. So now let's do some harder things. Do some things that are really difficult, difficult for most dogs to handle. Going outside, knocking on the door, things like that. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna remind him, down. Knock on the door. Good. Good, I always say good when you give them the reward, just like you saw me do. If you wanna say good as you come back in, that's okay, but definitely say good every time you reward him with the food. Down. This is usually pretty hard for dogs to handle. I'm gonna mess with the mail flap and ring the doorbell. Everything put together, good. And he's getting an extra big reward because that was a lot of stuff going on there. Good. And we have the really hyper little noisy dog in front of us. Good. Not that he had a problem with dogs in general, um, but it is an extra stressor. And I'm gonna unveil this little guy because maybe he'll be even noisier. We'll see what happens. And of course it gets noisier. The whole, the whole lesson is, I don't care what happens, when you're doing this mat exercise, you focus on me. And I'm actually gonna good, reward him so that he has to turn away from this distraction. See how he looks at it, but then he looks back at me and you reward. Good. So he has to turn away to get rewarded. And he chooses, he chooses to turn away. And he's, he, he's staying calm in the presence of this. If he gets up, no. If he gets up before, if he gets up before you reward him, you say no, and you step on the leash and put him back. This is not easy for him to handle. Make sure that you stick with the routine. Make sure he does it the right way. He waits until you actually stand next to him, you pat your leg and say, okay. And then we're gonna have him sit. I'm gonna do the door exercise on the way out. He waits. I come back next to him. I say, okay. I make sure, if you have to do a little prompt like that, it's okay, just make sure that he, see how I'm doing this? Make sure he walks through with you that he doesn't pull you through the doorway. And then on the outside, sit. In this case, I'm gonna let him be free, but you always release him outside after you go through that threshold. Then pat his chest, say go, go, go. And then he's free, and then we're gonna give him a little free time, so I'm gonna take him off the leash, and you can have some free time now. Sit. So this is the routine that Weaver goes through five, six times a day, every day. We always have him sit. We open the door. No, he's gonna wanna run in there because he loves his crate. That's what this is all about. Like, hey, you like it so much in there? You love your crate? You have to wait for permission to go in. Notice how I'm not restraining him? You're not holding him there. If he does make a mistake and pop up, you can always do that. 
just like I just did. You see, it's not a correction to cause pain, it's just a little signal that he got up too soon and you would say no at the same time. So now he's waiting. You open the door, no. So you just like that, close the door again. And if you have to, apply a little gentle but firm pressure, just like what you saw there. There's no jerking, popping, there's no pulling, choking. It's gentle but firm. You don't need to do any of that stuff anyway, and that would just stress a dog out, obviously. So let's try it again. This is what you're gonna have to do. Open it. Now he's gonna wait with my right hand. Go, send him in. We'll go in there, silly. <laughs> he was afraid of the door. And then he's gonna turn around. And guess what meets him? Nice treat. It's a treat. That's what we do every time we send him in the crate. That's why, one of the reasons why he loves going in there, because every time we send him in there, something really good happens, and it comes from our hands. We took this, this little uh, prong collar off of him. Um, we feed him in the crate, so when it's time to eat, uh, he's usually been outside first, we put him back in the crate, we go get the food, we open the door, bowl of food, gets a bowl of food in the crate, any bones, chewies, anything that he really is into in the crate, toys, plastic things, fabric things, things that squeak, whatever, yeah, it's fine, but it's not really as important as something that tastes good, something that he's uh, inspired to, um, to chew on for an hour or two, that's what I'm talking about, those kinds of things you give him in there. And uh, of course, we've been doing that now for a while since he's been with us, and he loves his crate. He always wants to go in there because every, every association with the crate is super positive and all good things happen. If you're upset or whatever, you never wanna, you wanna pretend like you're not, if you are, if you have to put him in this crate, but it's gotta all be happy time, positive stuff to go in his crate, so he loves to go in his crate. And I know he has, he's formerly had a lot of anxiety, so that's why we've really done this crate um, routine a lot and added a lot of structure to how you put him in and take him out of the crate and what happens in the crate. And so just stick with these rules to the T, do exactly what we've been doing here and you're gonna see over time that his behavior changes. Uh, and, and as we've spoken about, um, behavior is, is uh, connected to location and people. So when he's back at your house where he had those issues with you putting him places and handling him, they can flare up again for a while, but if you keep doing the things we did here, which obviously took care of them here, you'll see them fade away. It might be just three days, it might be three weeks, it might be a week, it never, it's always different. It depends how, how uh, consistent you are in doing exactly what we do. And also de just depends on the situation because every dog is different. Um, the good thing about Weaver is that he's not even a year old, so usually the younger they are, the usually the quicker they turn around. It'd be a lot, probably take a lot longer to change him if he was five years old and been doing it for five years. So there's a lot of uh, reason to, to think very uh, positive about his situation. So he sleeps in the crate every night, uh, all day. He's in and out, in and out. He might be in there for two hours and out for an hour. He might be in there for 45 minutes, out for another half an hour. It's just always random. It's never associated with anything anybody in the house is doing. He can be in there when somebody's home, or he could be outside for a little while, and, and uh, you know, when you leave, and then, because we have multiple people in the house, and then he goes in before I come back, and he's in this crate when I get home, and uh, vice versa. So, um, just keep it random like that. When you are gonna leave the home, make sure that you put him in not at the last minute. Maybe put him in even a half an hour before you go. Just make sure he's been outside for a long time, he doesn't have to go to the bathroom. Put him in like a half an hour before you leave. Give him his favorite bone, something you know he's crazy about. So he's still working on that as you're walking around the house getting ready. He knows what happens when you're about to leave. They, dogs know the signs. So the bone and being calm because he's enjoying something in there uh, will keep him from getting you know, all anticipatory like he used to get when he's just sitting there with nothing to do. So it helps a little bit. You wanna do all these little things I'm telling you uh, that add up to change. Not any one of these tips is gonna change everything, but every little thing helps a little bit. 
So also all the training has helped calm him down in general. So he's coming back to you being way less easily triggered to stress out. So he's, he can handle more stress now than he could handle before, obviously, from what you see on the videos. So that is the main factor of why he's going to change from uh, the way he used to be. Even if he has an initial flare-up, he'll, he'll get back into the groove quickly if you keep doing all the stuff we're showing you. So when I'm going to put him or take him out, let's say he's been in there for a while, I always would hang up that prong collar here and then the leash can go wherever you want it to go. And um, the prong collar, you don't want to bunch it up and toss it somewhere because it'll get all tangled up. So if you hang it up, that never happens. You attach the leash to the funny looking bucker, buckle. The, um, the, um, the round one is a spacer, that's all. You don't touch it. And so it's not twisted. You don't want it to be twisted up because it won't work. So let it hang, make sure it's not twisted. And then you open the door. He never comes out of here unless you give him permission. So if he tries to come out, you do that and say no if he tries to come out. What I always do is when I'm going to hook him up, I just give him a treat. So he's munching on that already. And then I can reach in. And this collar always goes right under his ears. It's, it's the collar that's closest to his ears. It's above the other collar, his collar with tags. So you always... Um, you always put it, that's the highest one up. Also, if you're going to take him out in public, you want to have a little choke chain. Well, I don't have one right now, but if you're going to take him in public, you have a choke chain on him, and it's always loose. It's, it's longer than the, the, cho the uh, prong collar, so that if the prong collar ever happens to come out off in public, the choke chain takes over. But you never use a choke chain for training because that could really screw up his neck. It's just hanging loose as a safety for that time, two or three times a year, which maybe the prong collar comes off for whatever reason. You have backup and uh, he do, you don't have him loose on the street. That's the only reason for the choke chain. So you'd have that on there too. And then he's got the leash attached to him. And I even practiced this thing. Good. He's already waiting, so I'm rewarding him. If he tries to come out, I'd say no and do that even though he didn't try to come out. And then I practiced this thing where I step back, holding the leash, no. And I wanted him to make a mistake, so I'm gonna put him back. And do this. Get my, <laughs> he's all sitting on the leash. So I'm gonna drop the leash and just leave it there because he's sitting on the leash, but I'm trying it again. See, he really gets, he made a momentary mistake there. I'm gonna give him a couple of big chunks for waiting. Good. See, he just, he just lost focus for a second, then he realized what we were doing. Now he's unquestionably waiting until I allow him to come out. I'm just gonna say, okay. He's gonna come out, we'll grab the leash here, do a little left circle like this, close the door, and now he gets to go outside and have a little bit more free time. And of course, taking him straight outside, we're gonna do this front door exercise, sit. As always, that door exercise, he sits, he waits, he has to stay calm. You're just stepping through to accentuate the fact that this is your boundary, that he's going to wait. Never call him to you through the boundary. That will teach him to rush after you, of course. He needs to stay in a calm sit state, wait for you to come back next to him. Okay. On the outside, sit. And then release him to be free. Go. Here we are with a greeting routine. Sit. Weaver was just barking at this guy like two minutes ago because he just came out to help us and, and surprise us. And all I did was call Weaver to come to me a couple of times and then had him stand there and then I approached him. And of course I've given him uh, some of this natural balance and he's just gonna do that. I'm gonna send Weaver over and I'm gonna say, go say hi. He's gonna take it. I'm gonna say, come, call him back to me. So obviously sit with a stranger on the street he gets over pretty quickly. He might bark when somebody walks past or walks up, but if you use the training like I did, he gets over it really quickly. It's because he feels safe when somebody's directing him, and when you handle him the way I handle him every day uh, for the last like four or five weeks, he knows that he's cool because you're in charge and he's safe because you'll tell him what to do and you handle everything. Just like this greeting routine, we practice it every day with different people. Go say hi. So he knows how it's gonna go. Come. So, good. It's just plugging in a new person to sit the place where all the other people have been. And, and 
the dog thinks, oh, okay, I got this. I know exactly how this works. I've done it with a bunch of other people and it, that person's always cool and nothing bad ever happens. All I'm doing is sending him over to accept a gift from the new person, then I call him back. So there's a lot of structure here in meeting a new person. Also, if you ever did have an issue with jumping on new people or anybody that maybe knows the person, but uh, he's, you know, gets really excited when they come over. This really makes that that um, jumping problem go away because first of all, there's no reason to jump. The treats are down there, and if the person knows him, they can pet him. Show what's happening over there. And of course, the dog in this yard will bark. But we're going to keep doing this. So you have the treat. Go say hi. Come. He's just very alert, and he'll bark. Good. But with that distraction, sit, I mean, actually coming near us, we're gonna just keep doing this greeting routine. No. And they're standing there. They're doing the worst thing. They're standing there staring at us. Go. Good, come. So watch how quickly, sit. We can just get Weaver to, no, come on. Click back into training mode here. We just keep keep doing your thing, especially when a distraction is that far away. Go, just keep doing your thing and come. Calling him good, back into sit, into his whatever you're doing with him. And it gets better. Go. And now everybody's coming out from everywhere. Come. So just show there, right there. And so, and also the ladies behind us too. So we're gonna, just gonna, <laughs> everybody's staring at us like, so we're just gonna show you, this happens to you, come. Call him away from distractions. And every time you do this, it gets a little bit easier. Come. So we just incorporated the greeting routine into distractions on the street as well. And also, it's you know it's pretty minor. He just barks and nothing else. But it's also because nobody's going like this, and he's not pulling like this. If this ever happens with distractions with with Weaver, he's going to be way worse because tension on the leash and controlling him and choking up and dragging him around is going to really, really make him a lot more stressed out, and that can cause uh, worse behavior. So always keep it loose. Communicate with little prompts like that, backing away, calling him to come to you, away from distractions, and you'll see it get better and better over time, and he'll relax quicker and quicker, just like what you saw here. We happen to encounter a dog at a, at a fence here. It barks, come. I'm just practicing, good, calling Weaver away. Yet another type of distraction you're gonna see. Come. And so whether this is an issue with you or not before, now you can see, why don't you go against the blue car there because there's a car coming past. You can see how easily it is to direct him away from a, a dog at a fence line that's barking, which is a very common thing that makes uh, dogs get out of control on, on a walk. But again, the loose leash is really important. Always come, using your commands to draw him away. And that becomes a pattern where he sees a distraction. And because you've done this uh, for a little while, you can do it a couple hundred times within a month easily. He just starts, he sees a barking dog. Either you only have to call him once or twice, or he just starts turning away and coming to you. And all you end up doing is just saying good because you never even had to say come because he came to you before you turned away from it before you even said come that'll start happening pretty quickly with him too so i just wanted to show you weaver with a barking dog at a fence do a little sit stay with weaver here sit a lot going on here at our local Home Depot, carts going past, and here's one now. We'll wait till it passes by. Looks like there might be a collision. Uh-oh. Hey, buddy. Good. So big distractions for most dogs in a sit-stay. Well, he's gotten, his sit-stay's gotten pretty good lately. 
Um, so I'll come here and practice or other public places and practice and just do like a sit stay here or there where you know he accepts me walking around both ways basic sit stay but if you can do this in the presence of all these people walking show, show to your left just all the people that are walking by constantly from the front door and it's great practice I always I just do a little bit a day because this could make a dog nervous really quickly especially a formerly really nervous dog like like um, Weaver but um, I always end on a success, like if this is all I did and maybe a down stay in another spot, um, that's, it's a good day and he's a little bit better and tomorrow he's going to be better than he was today, you know, end, end on a success. You saw what I did, I said sit, I may or may not, I don't remember, if he gets up you say no and you just, just a little bit of pressure, he goes back, as soon as his butt hit the, hits the ground you release it, so you're not popping, you're not going like this, it's really, you're not holding him like this because any kind of tension on the leash will give him more stress so as soon as he does what you want you release that and then of course he's waiting to be released until you come back next to him oh that good distraction there and um, he's waiting for you to come back next to him pat your leg and say okay and then he's gonna walk with you I want to show you just broken down and step by step uh, how I've been practicing the recall with Weaver. And so I always have the, my left hand, uh, the leash on my left hand, and I put my hand through the handle, and that way you can never possibly lose him. You don't have to choke up because you've got this here, and of course when you're practicing come, you want to have at least that six feet, and if you extend your arm you have eight feet because you want, you want to call him to you from some sort of a distance so there's no reason to do this just hold it like this and you always always have him um, when, if he's just staring at you like this which he's prone to do after you've trained him for a few weeks because he's always waiting for your next command you'll have to create your own distraction so the way I do it is I have my right hand as a target left hand leash right hand reward and I've got some in my palm but I'm using this natural balance sausage as a reward I toss a piece as a distraction because when you're practicing you always want to call him away from something if you're on the street or anywhere if he's if he looks a different way away from you then you call him away from it but don't call him when he's staring at you because that's not a real life situation you want him to hear that command when he's noticing something else or maybe even moving away from you uh, and then he hears the command, he breaks away, it comes running back to you. So you always practice that way. So I'm going to create a distraction in this case. Go. So he's over there eating that little reward. You can have him come. You can let him have it first and then call him back to you. Good. And see the reason that I have this in my left hand is because then I can, my left hand's right there since the leash comes off by his right ear when he comes to you, obviously. Good. It's just like that. And you have it. It's really easy. Then if you wanted to step into him and walk with him, you just switch hands and then you've got it. See, it's so easy. What I just did is really easy. Sit. I have him sit and then release him again. Go. And do it one more time. And he's going over there so he's distracted again. Left hand leash, right hand reward. Come. Good. See that? Everything happens at once. You say good the second you give him the treat. And you could even do this. You could say, come. And then you could say, good, and pet him too, and grab the leash on your way down from the pet. See? Because later on, the reason you use this closed fist as a target is because even now, he'll come to this. He has no idea why. He just knows that something good happens to him when he comes to this. But um, in an emergency, you're not going to have a reward. You're not going to have a leash. He's going to be loose, maybe on the street. And you just have to pretend like you have one. He'll come to this every time. And then if you don't have a reward in there, you say good and pet him at the same moment and grab his collar. If he doesn't have a leash, you got to grab his collar so he doesn't run off after he takes the treat or, you know, when he comes to you. So it would just be like, come good boy and you love him up if you don't have any treat and he still feels good about it so of course you never want to be calling him when you're angry and grab him when you finally caught him or whatever because that'll make him not never, never want to come to you so of course what you see throughout the videos you see me call him to come away from uh, the green routine and a dog at a, at a fence and other things it's always hey I want to give you a gift 
So that's the impression you give him every day, week after week after week. So whenever in an emergency, when you really need to have him come to you and, and it might save his life, he's, that's what he wants. He, that's, he's all about that more than anything else because of the way you practice. And I also backed away. When you back away, it draws the dog to you. So, you know, always back away whenever you can because it makes the dog rush to you faster. If he ever ignores your command, never repeat it. Just do this. Good. And I just did little prompts. It's like a little, it's not to cause pain. It's like a little tap on the shoulder. And he turns around, sees his target, and sees you backing away. And he's going he's gonna to come running. So always practice your recall, your come command, exactly like this. Down. There you go. Good. So you see the way that I'm doing that, uh, practicing that, uh, that down good is because that was his sticking point was uh, a quick down the first time you say it. And he's much better obviously, but I'm still having to help him a little bit with my left foot. So you saw how I did it at the same time that I said the word, the command, I did the action at the same moment. And that's the way that you get past this this sticking point and he'll just start doing it without you putting a little tension on the leash like that and then um, he still you know he still went there and then I rewarded him just like this good just like as if he's on the mat where he waits until you withdraw and he takes the food off the ground he's not trying to grab it out of your hand or you know touching your hand or anything and of course the stay is rock solid his stay is rock solid so once he's there Wherever you are, you can practice this downstay thing where you walk around both ways. If you're in a secure fenced area like we are now, good. You can drop the leash and practice walking much farther away. In this case, let's see how he handles this. I'm going outside this gate and even like leaving the yard and you know leaving him in a downstay. This is hard for him to do, so I'm going to remind him down. Going outside on the street, disappearing for all he knows, I'm not coming back. Coming back in. You know, so it's a he's got a solid downstay. We practice downstays all over the place. You can do giant wide circles around him, whatever you want to do. And he's it's real solid. So this is something you can practice in your back patio, your backyard. And uh, the stay is solid. The one little thing that he still needs to work on a little bit good is his actual down. You saw exactly how I've been doing it. And he's almost there, but every dog has their, usually their one little sticking point, something that they, they're not, um, you know, something that didn't come along with the rest of the training altogether. So that's the way you want to do it. If you keep doing exactly the way you saw me do it, he'll get to the next level pretty quickly. He's almost there. But um, don't say down. Wait for him to not do it and then do this because you'll get stuck in that pattern forever. In his mind, yeah, he talks to me, says that, I don't do it, and then he forces me down, and then he gives me a treat anyway. So don't ever do that when you have to, um, you know, when you say the command and he ignores it. Then you jump in five seconds later to try to struggle with him and, and force him there. Don't do that. Do, do it like I did it. I assume that he's not that good at his down yet with, you know, the first time I say it. So I'm just going to down all at once. And soon enough, you don't have to do this part. You just say down and because that's what always happens the second you say it. You're imprinting that pattern. You don't have to help him with your foot anymore. And so to release him, of course, he's always just waiting for you to stand next to him, pat your leg and say, no, nope. that anticipation, no, you need to watch that. He's listening to my every word, obviously. So really make him wait. Okay, that's how he leaves the downstay and sit. So if you're gonna release him to be free out of a downstay, have him sit. So he's still on the clock until you have him sit. You say, okay, he gets up, you have him sit, and then you release him to be free from a calm sit stay. Go, like that. And then you have a calm dog instead of releasing him out of a down. And a lot of times the dogs are anticipatory and they jump up and they're excited and you don't keep that calmness that you would normally if you release him out of a calm sit stay the way you saw me do it. So always release him out of a down like that. Okay, sit, and then 
go. Always do it that way. He'll stay a lot calmer that way.